Welcome to today's Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Bay Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. And we're here on a different day than usual and in a different venue. Um, but it's Medical Center Hour and it's actually the last one of the year. Our program today is called Beyond Words, Caring and Connecting in Late Life. It's a special event in the Medical Center Hour year. It's our annual Copaca Family Foundation lecture in the medical humanities. For 16 years now, this foundation, which was established in memory of Dr. Copaca B. Rao by his family, has made, has made possible this lecture grounded in a passion for improving patient care and especially for improving health professionals' communication with patients and families at the end of life. UVA is one of med many medical schools that have received the Packer Family Foundation funds for this sort of program. A little bit about Dr. Kopaka Rao, a medicinal chemist who rose from impoverished beginnings in India to earn advanced degrees in science. He emigrated to the US, where he had a most productive career in pharmaceutical research with Pfizer, and then in teaching pharmacy at the University of Florida. He believed passionately in scientific discovery, in teaching, and in being a good human being. This gentle and accomplished man and his wife raised three children, two of whom, Jaya Rao and Ram Kopaka, became physicians. And Jaya is actually well known to UVA since she did her internal medicine residency here. She's now an associate editor with the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine in Philadelphia. <coughs> Dr. Papaka Rao's last illness was so tragic for his family that in 2002, those two physician children published an impassioned essay in the Annals of Internal Medicine about how their father's doctor's communication with the family could have, well, should have, been better. Indeed, there was precious little good communication during that hospitalization. And the young doctors contended that their father's dying was all the more troubling to everyone involved as a result. Their father's doctors, they suggested, could have cared better for him medically if they had known more about their patient personally, if he'd been to them more than just another case. So our Copaca lectures have focused on communication, especially at or near the end of life. And we've had speakers from various professional backgrounds whose work explores the dynamics of how human beings, individuals, families, teams of caregivers relate to one another. We've addressed communication broadly, especially how persons express care and connectedness. It's not just words, which often become secondary or fall away altogether in critical situations or in the setting of some progressive illnesses. It's also gesture, posture, movement, facial expression, silences, nonverbal vocalizations, and so on. Particularly for persons with dementia or those nearing death, these opportunities for communication and continuing connection beyond words become paramount. This may challenge us and our healthcare enterprise living and working as we do in a culture that so privileges adept cognition, sharp memory, and great verbal facility. But the words of poet Tess Gallagher referring to communicating with persons with Alzheimer's dementia remind us otherwise. And I quote, I do believe that those dealing with Alzheimer's may witness and help their loved ones more than survive. They may lead us beyond forgetting to the sites of meaning by which we continue to companion each other against seemingly relentless odds. Their knowledge within the community may move consciousness of the malady, loss of memory, past this identifying disqualification of disease. We may mistakenly think forgetting eclipses other human abilities, when it most surely does not. So our Packa lecturer today, Anne Basting, lives out Tess Gallagher's insight. A professor of theater at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, Anne Basting is a wise and most accomplished pioneer of using the creative arts to address issues in aging, especially in settings where elders Word, words and memories are challenged by capacities for care and connecting among families and health care professionals remain strong. Through original arts practices such as time slips, creative storytelling, and her more recent Penelope project, 
Professor Basting is charting promising new ways of enriching communication and improving the lives of elders and their caregivers alike. We'd like to thank the Southern Gerontological Society, whose annual meeting is happening today and tomorrow in Charlottesville, for being our partner on this program. And now, please join me in welcoming Ann Basin. gestural language. Does anyone know that? It's super simple uh, movement. So um, this is my soul and my spirit. You may want to just give it a shot. There you go. Soul and my spirit. This is um, my heart or I love you. This, <laughs> this is, um, let me see, uh, I am calling you. I am, guess what this one is? Hearing <laughs> you, seeing you, um, my house. Now let me let me have you guess a few of these. Let's see. Water. What do you think that is? Water. 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 You're getting good. Um, this one. Mountain. 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 Yeah. This one. Wind. Tree. 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 Wind is actually this. Wait. Guess what this is. Stars. Stars. You're better than I was. I didn't know you were <laughs> So um, we taught about 50 of these to people in a nursing home, all through a care community, actually, but um, the nursing home in particular and the um, adult day program. And they gobbled them up. They wanted more and more and more. And when they were done, when we were done, I said, would you tell a story um, of, with some of those gestures, using those gestures? Um, about welcoming someone to your home. How do you welcome someone to your home? And they said, the first gentleman, Richard, um, said this, um, my heart is open to you. My soul and my spirit welcome you to my home. I am calling you. I am hearing you. Your eyes sparkle. And then we thought, well, we can just go home. Because we know what we've seen, and I think beauty is done. Check for the day. <laughs> so that'll come in in a little bit. You'll see that um, in a little bit. I want to just say, you know, what is beyond words? Um, how do you go beyond words? Um, it was a beautiful quote from Tess Gallagher about um, how do you companion? How do you just be with in the presence of someone? And how do you communicate in that moment just in presence with someone? Um, silence, as I've learned in my 20 years of teaching now, makes people really uncomfortable. And they try to fill it um, with communication. But sometimes communication happens actually mostly, more profoundly, in that silence if you learn how to read it and move inside of it. Um, so I'm going to do a spoiler alert here and tell you what is beyond beyond words, which um, is the word art. Um, poetry is a great example. Um, art is a symbolic and emotional language that doesn't need words, actually. Um, it's a moment of creativity, a moment of expression. Um, I am really comfortable in the world of art. I grew up um, drawing and painting and I went to school, I actually acted in plays for a little while, but I was really bad, so then I went behind, behind the stage and wrote for people. I got a doctorate in theater. I created theater as I was studying theater. Um, I specialized in avant-garde, where you certainly don't need words to make sense. In fact, most words don't make sense, so I'm very comfortable in that space. But I also totally acknowledge that the word art, sometimes saying it in a room like this, might be like yelling fire. Right, so I know that some people don't have a comfort, comfort with it, so I'm going to go backwards. 
why that's coming up. I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you the story of how we get to that moment, and then we'll move back. So story. Story is how our brains organize information. Um, narrative is how we make sense of things, how we create patterns, and we remember things. Story is how we come to get to know each other and build relationships. It's how we create a relationship with people who come before us through history, is story. It's how we create something to talk to the people who are going to come after us, leaving a legacy and telling a story for the future. It is really the core of how we engage with each other as human beings. It's how we know and learn who we are as we tell the story of ourselves and who we are. When neurocognitive challenges, and I say this because Alzheimer's, dementia, you all will be studying this and, and the people who are studying medical school, it is a big clump of things that we have a difficult time, even the folks who are doing massive large-scale research, pulling apart what is what. So I use neurocognitive challenges. Um, when language starts breaking apart, when mood becomes altered, when conceptual thinking becomes difficult, um, when in companion with that, we don't know how to engage with people. Talking on the phone might become difficult. It's uncomfortable. I'm not sure how to be in company with a person who's having these challenges. So people, family, and friends pull away. Social networks get clipped off, just like the ends of the, the neurons are getting clipped, the social network is getting clipped at the same time through stress and discomfort, and communication breaks. I just love the, this image, which is actually an image of an artwork um, from, I wrote this down, I can't see it on the slide. It is called the Keyboard of Isolation. It's an ad and art campaign from Family Care in the Grassroots Community um, in China by a group called DDB. So we end up with uh, isolation. And it's very difficult, I think, in the systems of care that we've created for people with dementia and neurocognitive challenges to tell the difference between the symptoms and the iatrogenic symptoms. Like, what, what are we creating as isolation um, from, from the way we're caring for people and from what is actually happening in the brain? It's really hard, I think, to keep those things out, especially if you've ever walked into a nursing home and seeing what I call brief solitary confinement, which is no penetration of connectivity among people. Everyone's seated in a row, oftentimes, unfortunately, right in front of the nurse's station, and there's very little sense of connection um, and relationship that people have. One of the first communication impulses, of course, particularly in a setting where you're trying to get something done, is to go to rational spoken language. Um, to orient someone to where they are, where you are uh, in that moment. And to oftentimes family impulse is to rebuild memory, um, to remind the person, you know, I couldn't be your sorority sister, I am your daughter, I was born at this time, I couldn't possibly be your sorority sister. And you're building up the bricks of the person's memory until you get this nice brick wall between you and the person that you're trying to reach and you can't reach the person by doing it. It's the, the approach that we're talking about today is to go around that wall or not build it at all. Just be, find out where the person is and to be in company with that person where they are. The reality, rather than all of that rational language and the impulse to rational language, is that only 7% of communication is verbal. We know that from all those fabulous communication researchers who tell us that. And the rest of it is broken down between uh, gestural, facial expressions, body language. So how and why we shift, and this is, I, I literally put my running t-shirt out on the kitchen table and took a picture of it. <laughs> I run the t-shirt. Um, the, the work I do with Time Slips, the creative storytelling nonprofit, is that's our slogan of forget memory, try imagination. Try to be in company with someone through imagination, letting go of the rational language and the, the impulse toward rebuilding memory. So it is crucial to know a person's past. Um, it's really important that you understand the patterns of the life that has been lived up until this moment. 
Um, but memory and relying on only on that information can um, can put a priority or a hierarchy of right and wrong when you're dealing with that person. So um, no, I think knowing that a person was an attorney their whole lives really informs a certain relationship that might that might help you decode behavior or meaning in the person's life. But only relying on that information doesn't give you that same walk around that wall to be in the moment and learn where they are right now and how you might reach that person right now. Um, it suggests that who they were might be more important than who they are right now. Um, and the key is to say the person as they are right now is the most important person in the room. How do I, how do I be a companion to them in this moment and understand who they are right now? Imagination, shifting toward that imagination gets you to create a shared moment of exploration. To, to inhabit the same world. It's almost like you're, uh, you're a space explorer and you're learning this new world. What are the parameters of that new world? Where are we? What, what's happening? What are the rules of this new world? How do I understand the world that this person is in? It enables us to build a community across age, culture, and ability. So I've used quite a few terms and I want to break down creativity for people who don't feel quite as comfortable in that world. I've got three different meanings of it. Um, creativity, creative expression, and creative engagement. I say creativity is a lot like, like jello. It's a very kind of amorphous word. You've got to kind of nail it down. So creativity, the definition that I like to use is Gene Cohen, who was a wonderful researcher, MD, um, former head of the um, National Institute for Mental Health, really has done an incredible job, um, passed away several years ago, but he did an incredible job trying to build the world of creativity, um, particularly for older adults, as a, as a mode of expression, um, and as a strength, as a remaining capacity and strength. Um, and he kind of combined, he picks up on Ronald May's definition, which is something new added to the world that has value. And the thing that's so great about that definition is, you know that little popsicle sculpture you made when you were in fourth grade? That has value to you and your grandparents, right? It doesn't say who values it. It can be whoever you want to have value it. Um, it can be a museum, it can be you and your grandparents, it doesn't matter. It encompasses both ends. Um, it's used to describe divergent thinking. So how can creativity is to flip something on its head, to look at new solutions, to look at new ways of doing something. Um, also, most commonly when I say, how would you all define creativity, people say, out of the box thinking. And that's what divergent thinking is. So creative expression. A funny thing happened in the professionalization of the arts. Um, and the story goes that we have the, um, the GIs to blame for it from World War II, which was <laughs> shocking, I know. They came home, and we needed suddenly graduate programs for people who were artists because of the GI Bill. So we built MFA programs all across the country. It was like a big burst of MFA training in poetry. You had to become a poet, a dancer, a, and suddenly you got a college, a graduate degree in that area. Um, and so something happened culturally at that time, which was that we thought maybe to be a poet, you had to have an MFA. Um, or maybe to be a painter, you had to have a professional degree. Or maybe to do these other things. And gradually, I think this feeling that we are innately creative is sort of drawn out of us. And, and we, don't, we feel a little bit of a separation. So in working with the arts, it's super important to know and to realize that discomfort where people might not take ownership or say to you the first thing is I'm not creative. And to say, really all it is is making and arranging sounds. All it is is making and arranging movements. That's creative expression. Making and arranging objects, uh, lines, colors. Making and arranging words, aka poetry and great writing. <laughs> making and arranging, like I said, colors and lines. When you put it that way, that feels like something you can do, right? I could, I could make a sculpture with the objects on the table right now. That, you are a sculpture. You just did it. That's it. That's, there's, you can study it and look at the history of it and see who you're in contact with and conversation with, but you have the innate capacity to do it. Creative engagement. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> what am I talking about there? That is using the tools and the framework of creativity to connect with another person. I'll just say that again. Using the tools and framework of creativity to connect with another person. Making a shared moment of creation. 
And this is this, this is where I think the magic box is. Um, and this is a quote from Raul May, meeting and joining an other, another person, without judgment or expectation. Something new can be born in, in body, mind, or spirit. That, that is exactly the moment of creation when you're co-creating something together, it feels like this very special moment of connection and understanding with another person. That itself is bringing something new into the world that has no value. So the key elements of this shift, of this approach, assuming a base knowledge of the person. So you can never get away with not knowing who the person is, um, but assuming that base knowledge, we shift the expectation of fact and memory over toward emotional, phatic, full body communication, shared imagination and experience, and doing something with someone, not for someone. Being together, working together. This is, the, this is where my work in the arts completely overlaps with relationship-based or person-centered based care, patient-centered care, all of those things, that's where those things come right together. So I see this work as being done once you make the shift into that world and that understanding of that. I see this work as being done in three levels. The first is an infusion into day-to-day -day relationships. You can actually pour this like water into your daily encounters with people. There's the program level, which is probably the most common of what people think about this kind of work. Like, I'm going to have a person go do a creative activity for an hour, three times a week, right? That's, that's kind of how we think about it and how um, arts therapists or artists who go in to work with older adults in places, that's how that they would structure their time. It's something on the calendar, um, it's structured scheduled time. And then there's this, this thing which is where I've sort of fallen into, and I'll, and I'll talk more about what this is, is these long-term projects in collaboration with partnering organizations that pair up, they, they use a theme to connect infusion and programming toward a long-range goal, and this is where you can get total institutional transformation, community transformation, where you're all working together towards something much larger. This sounds a little bit like hard to comprehend, but I'll give you lots of examples of it momentarily. First, I'm going to look at infusion. So in, in doing some research on communication, I, I really liked this, which is the, the, from way back in 2002, which is the, an acronym of SOLAR. To face the person squarely, to maintain an open posture, to lean slightly forward, to maintain an established eye contact, and to have a relaxed posture. It's, it's, it's a verbal, it, it's a bodily message to a person that you are there to be communicated with and that what they're going to say to you is going to matter to you, okay? Or do whatever they're expressing to you, there is going to matter. I also say, learn to read the power dynamics of space, of body in space and objects in space. So right now I have this big object up here, up here that's giving me a lot of power. I'm hiding behind this left turn. And if I actually could tolerate lavalier mics, I could wander <laughs> up and down the aisles and talk to you almost like face to face, right? So I could neutralize that. If I was, the microphone also gives me power. Um, it's, you can read power dynamics in space. So I say get to eye to eye uh, level. So this little drawing here is not eye to eye level. This is hierarchy of height in space. Um, so you want to get right, and, and this is helpful if you have good knees, you can squat or kneel or have a chair um, and be right at the person's level. Um, objects between you um, separate you from the person. And just notice what tools of power you're bringing to the moment. So mine are the microphone and the left turn. Um, but in a moment, you might have clipboard or something and that, that sends a message that I'm, I'm in charge of you. Um, and just to be aware of your tools uh, and how they might appear to be, be read by a person. So these are the things you bring into that moment of infusion. Uh, curiosity. 
all your observation skills, which I, I am so happy to hear that they learn, uh, medical students learn um, in visual arts and working in museums, looking, looking at art to help increase observation skills. Commitment to understanding. I am going to understand something in this moment. Uh, flexibility. Um, I use yes and there to denote, um, anybody here know improv, theater improv? Yes, look at that, that's awesome. Uh, the core tenet of improv is to say yes and, right? So saying yes to a moment is accepting and understanding and observing exactly what's happening on all levels. You're firing at all cylinders, you're picking up body language, you're picking up visual cues, you're noticing what's happening around you. The and is to add positively to the moment. Um, one of the rules, uh, if, if people who do comedy improv will tell you that you never negatively undercut someone. Uh, because you're pulling uh, power away from your partner in that way. You count on your partner always to build positively on whatever, whatever they're feeding you to respond to in the moment. That is the core rule of the flexibility and of relationship building, is to say yes and then build on something in a positive way. Um, bring all of your expressive skills to what I say calm and echo so that you can match a person and maybe bring a person, um, calm person with your facial expression, your vocal tone, and your gestural language. What can you physically do in those moments? You, invite, you can invite the person into the moment by asking a question, an open question, that can bring you into the same space. We'll talk about that in a moment. You observe with your eyes and your ears. You echo to give what I call proof of listening. And then you repeat. Um, you keep engaging. So what is proof of li listening, or what I call living proof? Um, it lets the person know that what you've said has gone and been understood and is going to have an impact on something. So you're really listening. You're not just maybe writing it down as proof of listening, and then they can see that you've written it down, echoing it back to the person to say, is this what you meant? They can say yes or no, and they can actually uh, guide you to a better understanding of what it is. Um, so that is giving, returning proof that they've been heard in some way. Oftentimes, people might give information and they never know if something's if it's gonna matter. Is that gonna matter? So how can you echo either in a gestural language or something verbally that's being said to you, how can you give living proof that what they've said mattered to you? So how do you invite someone into the moment uh, with you? How, how does one do that? Um, you very simply, and if I had a, 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 a huge workshop, we would break it in small groups and just do this right now. Um, observe and inquire about them, about yourself, about the environment in the moment. To, now this, this is a really crucial word here because it also relates to improv, to play. I think this is something that we don't, we, we kind of wring out of our daily moments, um, is play. Um, to go along, to play along, and make yourself vulnerable in that moment by playing along. Um, sharing something of your own life, of, of your own moment, of your own experience in that moment. Um, playing along and not controlling it or guiding it. Um, what if, creating a moment of what if, and seeing things from different perspectives. So one of, the, um, one of the exercises I like to do in some of my workshops is to, to, to increase um, observation skills and then give you a, a sense of how we could do something and create something in response to the moment. Can you just tell me right now what you hear in this room? Just give it a listen for a few seconds. What do you hear in this room? Clock ticking. Clock ticking. What does it sound like? Can anybody make the sound? Buzzing? Yeah, there's a buzzing. What else? The, the projector, what sound is it making? I can't hear it. Kind of a hum? We've got a... And then this... And then this. Who, who wants to do the shush sound of the, of, the, of the projector? Anybody? I can't see who's doing it, so you can just raise the sound. And Come 
projector? Okay. There you go. Awesome. Um, what we've done in the past with this, and also there's um, a little bit of crinkling of papers occasionally in here, right? In the past, I've done this in a grand ballroom with like 500 people. And I say, okay, can I have the ticking up a little bit higher? And the um, projector, okay, now the projector is higher than the ticking, and then bring that, and then bring in the buzz, bring in the buzz. <laughs> and we create this like symphony. And we also do it with movement, simply observing a shape in the room and giving an outline of that shape with our finger. And then moving it to the whole hand, where we might, there's a lot of cool shapes in this room, I have to say. And you're just responding to a shape in the room by outlining it with your arm and then speeding it up and slowing down. And we've had like sound and music and a, a complete modern dance happening in, in about five minutes with a whole room of 500 people. And then I say, stop, and this half of the room do it, and this half just observe. And this half is like, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen at a conference. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it's, it's, it is something new made up in the moment that has value and that people were laughing and having a grand time doing it. I think at the end of that, um, simply opening yourself to wonder. And I went, I was just up in DC and I went to the Renwick Gallery and there's an exhibit um, called Wonder at the Renwick right now. Um, and this is the key, this is the uh, panel. I just took a photograph and dropped it in here today. People have debated the meaning and value of wonder for more than 2,000 years. It has been described as everything from the origins of our understanding of the universe to how we respond to something defying categorization, to a naive emotion delaying us from reason, to a shock to the heart and a surprise of the soul. That is what you get in that moment of co-creation and communion. So you pass by this type of a window every day. This can be a prompt. What kinds of questions could you imagine asking someone in response to that prompt? How could you respond to that and ask a question about it? Anybody? Describe the colors you see. Anything else? What are we looking at? What are we looking at? That is the openness of all openness, right? What are we looking at? What sounds do you think there are out there? What does the feel? What does the weather feel like? What do the leaves feel like? Can you make the shape of the trees, right? I think this is another way, when you're working with people who are um, maybe beyond language, of being able to speak, um, it can be very difficult to know what strengths and capacities are there. And this is inviting them to express them to you in another language. Um, if most people, if someone, if they're working with someone with dementia who is beyond language, might um, walk right by and not engage and invite someone because they know the language that they come out. But I can't tell you how many times I've stopped and said, um, you know, look at that tree. How would you make that tree? Let's make that tree with our hands. And the person makes a beautiful exhibit of that. Um, and another really powerful moment where I, I went and did an artistic house call um, in a project called The Islands of Milwaukee with a gentleman who was completely beyond language. And I knew from talking with his wife that he walked along the beach of Lake Michigan. And he picked up, he had some driftwood in the kitchen where I was standing with him. And I said, um, Jim, can you tell me, can you show me how does water move? And he picked up a piece of driftwood and he began to move with it and to do a dance with the driftwood as though it was being moved along the water. And then he would do that. It, differently with each piece of driftwood and then set it back down into this sculpture on top of this trunk that was sitting in this kitchen. And it went on for about 30 minutes. Um, and then I, I looked at his wife and I said, oh my goodness. And she said, please film it on your camera. So I'm sitting in this tiny kitchen of a duplex and I have my little iPhone and I'm trying to film it and he's 
dancing in this beautiful way and then holding stillness and then moving in and out of it. And it became an inspiration for an entire piece that we then did with the Sojourn Theater Company. I don't have that video for you today, but it's just a really great example of what if you don't ask the question? Again, infused moments, micro moments of imagination, simply asking what people hear. Simply asking people what patterns they see. Can they echo and design a pattern with their hand? This comes from actually a retired surgeon whose wife um, had dementia, has since passed away, based in Cleveland. And Charlie told me that after sort of learning how to shift from memory to imagination, um, first of all, he said, I can't believe I've been driving my wife crazy for three years, telling her the facts of everything that's going on. Um, and then I learned that at the dinner table, when she's frustrated because she can't figure out what to call the ketchup, to pass, say pass the ketchup, I say, what do you want to call it? Let's make up a name for it. What do you want to call it? Red sauce. It's red sauce. That's great. <laughs> Let's call it whatever we want to call it in that moment. Let the person teach you a new language. This just came up on my Facebook feed from the month of March, where um, a police officer was called because a woman's mother, who takes a walk every day, um, wanted, kept walking. I don't like the word wandered off, but kept walking. Um, and the daughter was really panicked, and so the police went out to find her. They found her. And the policeman instead, uh, very, very wisely, using this shift approach, walked up instead of alarming her, she said, um, I'm taking a walk, are you out taking a walk too? And he said, yeah, do you want to walk together? I would love to walk together. And they walked together right back to the house. So that moment of saying yes and was a moment he easily could have been, your daughter's worried sick about you, you know, people are out searching for you, you shouldn't keep walking, you need to be, you know, no, none of that was going to work, but to be to figure out where she was in that moment and to accompany her in that moment back to a place of safety. So how the other component of this is to make these moments meaningful for the person. And there's three components of meaningfulness here. One is that it connects to the person's history and identity, and that can be um, simply asking the person for self-expression in the moment. Um, it should be pleasurable, and that pleasure might be an intellectual challenge, or it might be, you might be able to tell it's pleasurable by positive affect, right? Other, AKA smiling, <laughs> the non-scientific term. Um, and the third component to me is really, really important, and we forget about opening access to this to people, which is connecting to the world beyond the individual, creating a sense of belonging by connecting to something larger than just that person in that moment. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. Some of the research about these kinds of approaches, um, I just, I, I don't want to go too deeply into this because essentially the approaches in the arts aren't enough yet. We don't have enough large scale research to be able to do my fantasy, which is how you prescribe it, right, in the future. Um, that we know that these core um, positive opportunities for self expression, Connection, social connection to other people. Um, oftentimes, uh, dance and song also have, um, uh, frankly, just oxygen flow and, and physical movement, so that that's helpful as well. And also, patterning um, is helpful as well. So, we know that it's increasing communication, it's giving positive affect, it's reducing challenging or behaviors that um, staff don't like, <laughs> in other words. Um, because the person has a sense of belonging and purpose. Uh, so this, a, a need to find it or to get out of a situation where someone doesn't understand their purpose or feel empowered uh, is reduced. Um, it also, because it's relational, you see positive impact on the care side as well. So family, staff, um, volunteers have positive experience as well. Um, there's, there's some nice research about you know, medical students who are doing service learning using these kinds of approaches. And then when you get into that zone of improvisation, um, you learn a lot about communication, you learn how to be in company with people with dementia and people 
um, beyond, beyond language and words and improving attitudes towards it as well. Um, I'll just highlight my, my favorite study, which is um, the Boyle Buchanan Buckman study of 2010, which is suggesting that ha if one has a sense of purpose in their lives, it can be, it's seen as preventative, it has preventative, it's associated with preventative qualities against dementia, um, <clears throat> which always makes me inspired to ask for 1% of pharmaceutical funding research to go toward purpose. But I think we're finding that that actually might have more impact. And then this, this thing that I've been really into lately, um, which is applying some of the more general well-being um, studies, um, which tend to have much larger sample studies. And we get very comfortable with off-label um, prescription of things for people with dementia, because it's very difficult to test a lot of things with people with dementia. Um, I think we should be just as comfortable with applying some of this research to populations with dementia, which is that we know that leisure activities contribute to well-being. We know that now that gratitude interventions of, of figuring out how to be thankful for one's, um, what, what one has in one's life um, contributes to well-being, that neighborhood volunteerism contributes to well-being, and that altruism contributes to well-being. This sense of contributing to one's community, first of all, is a radical thought in that a person has a community, if, that they are a person if they have dementia, that they have a community and that they can give back to it is uh, a series of three radical statements <laughs> that I think I've seen work time and time again. The one, the one example I'll give you, and this is where I connect with the meaningfulness. If you think about your own life and the usefulness and the purpose of your own life and how meaningful it is when you feel that you've had an opportunity to give something to another person, to be useful and to have a positive impact on another person, um, teachers get to feel this um, often, um, that, and, and also in the health professions, that you've helped someone, right? When you're at a stage of your life where disability um, turns that system back at you, and you find yourself overwhelmed by receiving, almost to a place of passivity, of I'm receiving care, I'm receiving care, I'm receiving care. Another thing we've cut off from that person that's part of their well-being is the ability to give back. And so to figure out how to make that, reconnect that meaning-making capacity for that person. A really simple, playful example. Um, on the Alzheimer's Association list of 101 activities to do with people with Alzheimer's, and I, I say, if you want to get depressed, read that list. <laughs> you need to infuse them with meaningfulness. One of those is clipping coupons. And an example in a workshop I did um, where some, I said, can you make that activity meaningful? And they said, we've done this, actually. This was an exercise we did. We got out all kinds of magazines and newspapers, and we um, asked people to clip out their favorite thing. We told stories about that product, um, either made-up stories or stories from their own lives about when they used them, um, this toothpaste, what do you think of this name, or did you, did, what was the story of you using toothpaste, or do you have a funny story about toothpaste in your life? And then we wrote them down on little, long, narrow, beautiful pieces of paper. We wrote the stories. And then we took a field trip to a nearby grocery store with tape and the stories and the coupon. And Marsha already knows where I'm going with this. They went out like little goblins and little fairies into the grocery store and they found the object and they taped the story and the coupon to the object and then they silently crept away right back, back home. And it was like, oh, what a what a fun, naughty little that, I mean fairly naughty, right? Like they just they played a little trick and they gave someone a present, right? They gave someone a present. And the radical feeling of that. Um, to share a story of their own lives in that way was quite beautiful. So, so how I've done this with time slips, and I'll go through this super fast, but um, there's a fun story in here to tell you about it. We have free storytelling software that has over 100 prompts on the website. And a lot of them are image-based, some of them are question-based at this point. Um, here's one of the um, images that we've used um, that I love the story for this. And, and the actual creative storytelling, improvisational storytelling approach that is, um, there's a training for it on, on the website, is really about learning to ask those open-ended questions and, and, and blending all the responses together, whether it's a movement or a word or a song or a sound, 
into the story itself. And this is the oh no yeah this is the story um, that came from that image from a group that um, put this onto the website. It is 1917. This man is a French First World War veteran who was shot in the back. His name is Harry. He's 27. He has a dancing cane for doing the cha-cha. He has no family but a lot of friends. He is outside in France. That comes from where you want to say he is. He's going to a local cafe for a glass of wine. He is focused on contemplating his life. You can feel the open questions inside it that you're responding to. There is a giant butterfly behind him. He loves it. He is not afraid. It signifies peace. He's hoping to meet someone new, a woman perhaps. When they meet, they'll talk about spring and new beginnings. He's trying to forget what he experienced in the war. After that, maybe he'll get laid. <laughs> These are people with long lives, let me tell you. <laughs> She'll get married, but not to him. To someone he all, she already knew, who bakes good baguettes. <laughs> so these stories can be very complex when people um, are telling them. So here are some other ideas. So in a program mode, in like that storytelling mode, you could invite someone to write a poem about this product. What do you want to call it? What does this make you think of? What does it make you feel? Um, and then give the bottle with the poem to someone, anonymously or to a friend or family member. You could create a dance about this. How do you use this in movement? How is it made? What does it make you think of? How do people, um, what do people do with picnics? Uh, it can go on and on and on. Now this next level, and I'll do this super fast, I just want to get to a little video about a product project, is um, coupling all that infusion approach with the activity and program approach into these long-range projects. Um, and so for this, it could be um, picnic stories, poems and word collages about things at picnics, inviting friends to a picnic, actually holding the picnic, telling stories about every product that's at the picnic, and inviting people to tell and create their own. It could be a wonderful family-based intergenerational project. Um, I'm going to speed through that. This is an approach now that we're starting to see that part of the wellness of the individual is making sure that the person has a sense of connectedness to their larger community. And using creativity and creative engagement as that soft tissue that can connect people all around that community. Um, I'll skip this one because it doesn't have a... Uh... This one is actually a former student of mine. Um, it's called Stage Right Theater. She walks into a room with people with dementia, and she says, what do you want to write a story about today? And they write a story in that first moment. The next day at the workshop, they write songs based on that story. Um, and then they do movements based on that story. And in the third workshop day, they invite family and friends and staff, and they put on, and they rehearse and perform an original musical with an accompanist. It's been incredible. <laughs> Boom, 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 uh, three workshop series, original musical. This is a long range, two year project that I was involved with that I still have a sense of wonder about, um, low of these five years later, where we collaborated with an entire long term care community, independent, assisted nursing home, and adult day. Um, and we, together we read The Odyssey, and we broke it into a hundred different activities the staff led activities. We partnered with a professional theater company who came in and led activities. We, I had my students trained to go out and hold and host and facilitate activities. Um, and it was a joint mammoth effort that ended up with a professionally produced play that was staged site specifically through the care community. So that one that I described to you in the very opening of this, of, of my heart is open to you, my soul and my spirit welcome you my home. That was just one of the many activities that was led by a professional choreographer. Um, this one was exploring the, the meaning of heroes and hero stories, the structure of the hero story. Who are heroes in your everyday life? Um, another one was the same group at the Adult Day Center wrote letters. What would the letters be like between Penelope and Odysseus? And they wrote the letters. Um, they read them aloud to each other. And then they said, how would the letters get back and forth? And the people said, by bird. So then they folded the letters into origami birds. And they made this beautiful installation of origami birds of, out of all of those letters. We did a project because Odysseus, if you remember the story, comes home and Penelope has kept home for him 
in place for 20 years during his absence. What does home mean to them? Why would Odysseus strive to come home? So we first did it from his perspective and Penelope's perspective, and then we did it from their perspective. What does home mean to you? We also made a mile-long weaving because Penelope was also a weaver. And we wanted to denote the course of the play through the care community so people could follow the weaving. And to do this, we wanted it to be accessible, accessible to anyone who could do it. So we got, you can see these kind of the outline of the plastic rings that go around six packs. And that people could either, if they had physical disabilities, just move a piece of fabric through it. Or you can see people got very, very elaborate with um, crocheting all the way around as well. And there's um, Lenny doing the, you know, the, the welcome dance in the nursing home. Um, let me, another final piece was um, Penelope endured 20 years of not knowing if Odysseus was alive or dead. Um, and she endured 108 suitors who took over her home. Um, what do you endure every day? And it became a very profound um, project, a uh, little activity. And then we made talisman for all of those items that they endured. And the last thing I'll do is just show you this quick video. black screen for a few seconds. This is the process leading up to the final performance. Penelope is played so I'm gonna, is it okay if I push open call by anyone who wanted to. I'll, I'll get up and, and turn you around. Yes, let's see. <laughs> Is it is a lock on? Oh, there we go. Arnie, you didn't, you didn't tell me your lock was on. We were, <laughs> we were going to go for a roller coaster ride otherwise. You know, the story is all about Penelope. We're looking for Penelope. We go through all through the building to find her. And when we finally find her at the end, there's not one Penelope, there's a hundred. So that's what we find on the other end, that actually we've been looking for Penelope but there's a Penelope story in everyone, that everyone is weighted, everyone has love, everyone has a story of, of being a hero in your own life. My eyes, they sparkle like stars. Stars. I'm calling you. I'm calling, calling you. I am seeing you. Your eyes, my beloved, sparkle like the stars. You are the ones that make this place home. If, if the gods will grant us a happier old age, a happier old age, we will be free from our trials at last. We'll be free from our trials at last. If the gods will grant us a happier old age, we'll be free from our trials at last. I'm going to close there. I think I have five minutes for questions. <laughs> Actually, I have quite a few more projects to share with you, but um, I don't have time. Thank you for a very wonderful and presentation. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, and all of you have mics at your chairs. So all you have to do is press the green uh, so the green light comes on and hold it in order to ask the question and be heard by everyone. I will also mention that in conjunction with the Southern Gerontological Society meeting this evening at 845 at the Boar's Head, in the original ballroom at the Boar's Head, there will be a screening of a documentary film of Penelope, of Penelope, the documentary, about the Penelope Project. The documentary film was actually made by Anne's husband, um, and it will be shown, I think, on PBS. It's already been on. It's been, it's been, it's been on. on. Okay. Um, but there'll be a screening of that and some conversation afterwards. A five dollar donation is suggested. Um, do we have questions? Comments? I have 
glad you're in silent. <laughs> It certainly was occurring to me that there's a lot that's quite useful for persons in the health professions and engaging with patients and uh, and also with family members yeah. um, and and with peers. Um, I found myself looking at the trees outside that and starting to think that people who sit in this auditorium occasionally probably do look out of the trees, but how do we think about them? And what I do we do? One of my one of my goals is to create. Um, creativity assessment tool that um, is less about identifying loss um, than it is about, it's all about identifying remaining strengths, um, particularly with people with dementia, because we, we give that super quick mini mental status exam, which is all about identifying loss, but then we don't know what's there. Um, so that we, and those, the loss test is helpful maybe in reaching a diagnosis that's all bad news for the family, but the creativity assessment could be something that lets people know what strengths are there and how they might communicate. Questions? Okay. Let, let us know who you are. I'm Meredith Johnson, I'm a first year medical student, and I'm actually from Wisconsin today. Okay. Uh, and actually, less of a question, more of a comment of uh, gratitude, because um, I've actually been in a situation where I was visiting an entirely nonverbal dementia patient, a patient with dementia, and was very stumped. I wish I had this information three years ago because I futilely attempted to communicate over and over and over again, hoping that maybe something would sink in. Uh, not it never crossed my mind to attempt a different form of communication. A really powerful story, I think, um, I shared with Marsha earlier was um, just how, how to also just be in company as well and kind of learn and be with the person. Um, Liz Lerman, who's a dancer, talked about her uncle at the end of his life um, was, was very, very in, in stages in hospice and was, his arm was spasming and his wife was begging to have him sedated because it was really distressing to her that it was happening. And Liz says, let me try something. And she just put her arm over his arm and together they moved when the arm was with um, spasm. And it became a dance. And that was proof of listening to him, of I am here and I'm seeing that this is happening to you and I'm going with you. And the wife, of course, was crying and said, can you teach me how to do that? Can I? Can I be in that moment with him. It might be something to, just as an approach, um, a way to be in that moment with the person, uh, which is often part of part of it. Would you come on? Would you come on? Uh, yes, uh, I thank you also, and I wish, again, I had this seven, eight years ago when my father was at the end of his life, because I worked so hard to get him to be back to normal. And I wish now that I could have been okay with just accepting him where he was and providing um, this different approach. I think it's important for us to get these concepts young <laughs> so we can practice them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It also has parallels for people with um, cognitive disabilities at any age. Um, so it's, it's a lifelong thing. And it's, I do it with my kids all the time. Yes, so in particular that project, the islands of Milwaukee, where we were, we had done Penelope and we knew we could bring people out of their rooms, we were giving them meaning, we, had cre we did a big, the book that's coming out of May on this does a big evaluation of the impact and we, we clearly, clearly worked to bring a layer of meaningfulness um, and possibility into this entire care community for staff and family and volunteers and residents. Um, and we thought, how can we bring this to people living at home? Because 95% of older adults and people with cognitive disabilities are living at home. Um, and so that was where this artistic house call came in. Um, we sent out 
provocative, kind of poetically worded questions with home delivered meals and meals on wheels, um, with uh, phone calls, uh, volunteer phone calls for telephone reassurance programs and just making sure the person was okay that day. Um, and then those questions were responded to by voicemail and we created 22 radio pieces out of those responses. Um, and then we would follow up anybody who left their name and phone number with us um, by asking, by just saying, giving proof of listening, this was a great answer, would you ever want an artistic house call? And some people, whoever said yes, we would arrange to go out and do an artistic house call. So I went to Jim, someone else, a painter, went to um, Angie, Angie wrote poems. Um, I also went and visited Bill, who had Parkinson's and had a real difficult time speaking, but could sing to no end. And so he told me a story about rocks. We rewrote the lyrics to Rock of Ages, and then we gave it to a sound artist to layer in a bed of sound. And if you go to um, islandsofmilwaukee.org, you can read Bill's story and hear that song. Quite beautiful. That whole project was then shared in Milwaukee City Hall, which is a, I do this because it's an eight floor atrium. It's just a beautiful historic building. Um, and you could learn about these people who are hidden treasures in our, in our city. I'm afraid we're out of time, but um, I'd like to thank Andy and for opening these possibilities for us um, and for realizing that the people in Milwaukee who are growing old are very lucky indeed to have you and, and your projects there. This, as I mentioned, is our last Medical Center Hour of the year. We hope that um, we're grateful for your patronage, but we also hope that you'll offer us some suggestions of ideas, potential speakers, things like that uh, in, the, in the intervening months, and we'll resume our programs in, in early September. Um, again, there is this opportunity to see the, um, the Penelope, the documentary, uh, this evening. But again, thank you so much for being here, and it's been a great year to spend with you. So